Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. N. Shivasenani from uh, University of Hyderabad. Under the topic uh, Vedic, Epic and Puranic Culture, today we study the module Polity in Ramayana. Our learning objectives are uh, understand the system of government, especially the interplay amongst King, Sabha and Dharma. Uh, we also seek to understand the organization of society, both politically and administratively. Uh, we'll also look at interstate relations and military affairs, and then uh, wrap up with uh, a consideration of the continuity of polity of India uh, before Ramayana and post Ramayana as well. Uh, the way a society organizes itself is a very important aspect when we try to understand the culture during any period. In Ramayana, much information is available about the polity. As many of the key incidents in Ramayana, such as the impending coronation of Rama as Yuvaraja and his subsequent banishment are firmly within the political domain. Uh, we consider some of these aspects and uh, at the end we also look at uh, continuity of polity both from pre-Ramayana times and post-Ramayana times. As explained earlier in other modules, Dharma is both what is upheld and the upholder. It is that which when followed leads to the maximum good of the people. Economists call it the Perito Maximum. It is both constitution and also the code of uh, morals, ethics and values. In the Ramayana state, upholding Dharma was the duty of the king. Thus, the king upheld Dharma and Dharma is what protected the king. If the king were good, there would be no famine no untimely deaths, etc. in a kingdom, generally the people were all happy and such a king enjoyed popular support. To decide on questions of dharma, the sabha was uh, consulted. This was the primary relationship amongst these three. Questions of dharma are not uh, straightforward. Let us just look at an example. We know the incident when uh, Dasaratha's uh, boons, so-called boons were communicated to Rama. So, now that he has been asked to go to the forest, what could he do? There were three suggestions given to him. First one given by Lakshmana was, uh, Brother, why don't you kill father and then ascend the throne? The second suggestion was given by Dasratha himself. He pleads Rama, imprison me and then ascend the throne. If Dasratha is imprisoned, then he is no longer capable of uh, sanctioning his bones. Therefore, uh, it is still dharma. Then Vasishtha says, there is no need to do any of this. Rama, you go out and start another kingdom. The people will follow you. We will see that in the time of, times of Ramayana, new kingdoms are started all the time. Now, Rama's reaction to all these three is very interesting. He doesn't say any of these three is adharma. He accepts them as Kshatra dharma, the warrior court, but says that he wants to follow the sadharana dharma because he also wants his father uh, to be known as a man who kept his word. So we see that in a given situation, there are four different uh, possible actions, all seemingly within the realm of dharma. So it will be appreciated that questions of dharma are complicated. Since the king was supposed to follow and uphold dharma, Rama is celebrated as the personification of dharma. We have this shloka from Ramayana, Ramo Vigrahavan Dharmaha, Sadhu Satya Parakramaha, Raja Sarvasya Lokasya Deva Namiva Vasavaha. The very famous line, Ramo Vigrahavan Dharmaha. Rama is Dharma personified, the ideal king. This was the relation between Dharma and the king. Sovereignty lies with the king. There are some historians who try to say that uh, sovereignty lies with the Sabha, but anybody who considers the literature, ancient literature as a whole, has to conclude that sovereignty firmly lies with the king. In fact, it is repeated in many places. It's worth repetition here. It is due to the king that there is order in the society and law is followed. In other words, the king alone upholds dharma. Arajakatva, anarchy or kinglessness is much dreaded. In uh, Ayodhya Kanda 2.67, immediately after the death, death of Dasharatha, the evils of Arajakatva are bemoaned before the council of Amatyas and Mantris requests Vasishtha to invite a prince to be the king. There was a vacuum in Ayodhya when Rama left for the forest and Dasratha died. That's when this happened. All aspects related to the king, his training, his daily schedule, his advisors, 
formal assembly such as sabha etc are all designed to ensure that the king follows dharma we can briefly look at the education duties of king uh, the education of a prince the syllabus included vedas vedangas sciences arts and literature and then extensive military training especially in dhanurveda riding and breaking of horses and elephants military tactics strategies etc you will find that this list starts with vedas dharma is at the top of the list if we minutely look at the trainings and uh, duties that the king received self control is emphasized above all king should take a decision only after consulting with his ministers uh, then decision once taken should be implemented without delay a king's decision should not be known to anybody it should be known only after uh, the results are known it should be known from results king should personally attend to royal duties in case the king is leaving the capital adequate arrangements must be made for administration king should respect public opinion if you look at all these various aspects it comes out that king uh, training was designed to ensure that dharma is upheld now what is the relation between sabha and dharma the sabha was consulted to resolve questions of dharma and to decide the course of action in a given situation we just saw that the king has been advised never to take a decision without consultation this consultation could be a limited one with his ministers or uh, it could be an extensive consultation which is done in dharma which is done in a sabha we see many sabhas in the ramayana after dasharatha's death it is the sabha which decides to invite bharata to be the king bharata rejects the offer saying that uh, it is against dharma of ikshvakus for a younger brother to be king when the older elder brother is alive again we see that when vali does not return from his fight with the rakshasa it is the sabha which decides that sugriva should be crowned the king even ravanasura convenes a sabha to decide the course of action once hanuman is captured we have one more sabha when uh, the war council when rama and his army come to the gates of lanka so we see that the king uh, holds consultations and uh, sabha is extensively used to decide the question of dharma it's not that sabha is always right as some of these examples show but uh, sabha played a very important part in deciding what dharma is so the interplay is like this the king was supposed to uphold dharma and the king consulted the sabha to both to seek advice on what the appropriate course of action is and also to confirm his decisions uh, as i said we see that bharata did not accept the decision of the rajakarta raha that he should accept the kingdom instead he convinced the council that rama should be approached and requested to come back and rule in the war council that i just spoke about vibhishana advises rama ravana to return sita in the in the sabha he speaks very openly and then uh, ravana then asks the council to reconsider the question and after much deliberation they end up banishing vibhishana uh, similarly before accepting vibhishana in his camp rama seeks advice from his own uh, counselors who all give their opinion and we see that as uh, given in the training of a king the king listens to all the opinions and then forms his decision which was to accept vibhishana similarly dasaratha's proposal to anoint rama as a yuvaraja uh, was presented to the sabha for their consent and uh, there is an overwhelming approval that we see there uh, therefore uh, we see that the king's main duty was to uphold dharma and sabha played a very important part in both deciding what dharma is and in confirming that a decision is as per dharma now the big question is decided we can look at the administrative structure of that we find in ramayana ramayana describes dasaratha and later rama <clears throat> as having eight amatyas or sachivas including sumantra Uh, please note that i am using only the words amatyas and sachivas not mantris mantris are used in a slightly different sense in ramayana sumantra was also the charioteer and a sort of personal secretary to dasharatha this gives us a sense of uh, what these amatyas were doing in addition to these amatyas uh, there were the ritviks two main ritviks are mentioned vasishta and vamadeva we cannot say there are only two ritviks because uh, ritviks are actually people who preside over a sacrifice and different sacrifices require a different number of ritviks we can say that vasishtha and vamadeva were the main ritviks though the primary duty of ritviks is in conducting yagnas it is clear from ramayana that they also gave advice in matters of state when asked for then we hear of seven other hereditary mantris 
సుయజ్ఞ జాబారి కాశ్యప గౌతమ మార్కండేయ దీర్ఘాయు అండ్ కాత్యాయన ది అమాత్యాస్ అండ్ మంత్రీస్ టుగెదర్ ఆర్ రెఫర్ టు యాజ్ అ రాజకర్త అర్హ లిటరలీ ఇట్ మీన్స్ దోస్ హు మేక్ ద కింగ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ దిస్ గ్రూప్ ఆఫ్ రాజకర్త అర్హ అమాత్యాస్ అండ్ మంత్రీస్ who request vasishtha who kind of delegate their power to vasishtha and request him to invite a suitable prince you know once rama and lakshmana left uh, they were bharata and chitrugna and there could be other contenders so this council of king maker said uh, uh, told vasishtha sir please anoint uh, invite a suitable person so these were the key administrative heads of the political uh, uh, setup in uh, ramayana that we see if you look at the sabha the sabha or parishad is presided over by the king amatyas ritviks and mantris are in attendance the sabha included the nobles of the kshatriya varna and the elite among vaishyas uh, that is naigamas and shreshthins they were also present in the sabha which was conveyed before deciding rama as a yuvaraja other kings in the empire were also invited with the exceptions of kings of uh, kekaya and videha that is the father in law of kaikeyi and the father in law of uh, Sita were both not invited, but other kings in the empire were also invited. Uh, we should understand that different sabhas had a different composition. So one feature of uh, the coronation sabha was that all other uh, uh, Samantha Rajas were also invited. Otherwise, we see that, uh, see that leading citizens or representatives of Patanas, Nagaras, Ghoshas, Gramas, etc. These are normally called Mahattaras. They were also uh, invited. and the citizens of the capital called pura and the countryside called janapada or rashtra also attend we must emphasize that there was no fixed composition of sabha uh, different sabhas that we come across in ramayana seem to have uh, different uh, uh, compositions but to summarize it would uh, involve people of all the four four varnas the nobles and the elite among uh, vaishyas along with the representatives of Uh, smaller administrative units and general people as well uh, this is an interesting question was there a representative assembly since we are studying ramayana in depth uh, to understand the political structure this question comes up today like we have the lok sabha was there a representative assembly at the time of ramayana many modern scholars opine that the term paura janapada refers to two houses with representatives of pura and janapada with a further out of uh, outer bahya and an inner abhyantara division but if you look at traditional commentators on ramayana they interpret the term paura janapada to mean the citizens of pura and janapada there need not be a contradiction here in my view a leading citizen tends to be the official representative even today if we go into the villages we see that uh, the leading citizen is also the official representative the sense of valmiki is that people's opinion is to be gauged valmiki does not say it is a representative assembly but he is very clear that certain decisions need the adhara of people they should have acceptance among people and gauging people's opinion could be through inviting uh, citizens leading citizens or official representatives this opinion we have strength from other texts like mahabharata arthashastra etc also but what can be said is that uh, there is no clear proof that it was a representative assembly but uh, practically speaking it could very well be representative given the rigid structure of the society next we come across a very interesting aspect called tirthas uh, tirthani ramayana says only the name tirthani is mentioned the number of tirthas is not mentioned the list that is given uh, is from uh, other texts such as arthashastra and mahabharata Uh, these are the 18 administrative heads and these are well known the mention on ramayana gives us no doubt that 18 tirthani were uh, intended because in the particular aspect uh, rama teaching uh, uh, the science of uh, government to bharata says that amongst the 18 tirthas you must spy uh, 15 of your own tirthas and 18 of your enemies so we do know that uh, ramayana mentions 18 tirthas those are the mantri purohita yuvaraja సేనాపతి దౌవారిక అంతర్వంశిక కారాగారాధికృత్ అర్థ సంచయకృత్ కార్య నియోజక ప్రాడ్ వివాక సేనానాయక నగరాధ్యక్ష కర్మాంతిక సభ్య ధర్మాధ్యక్ష దండపాల దుర్గపాల రాష్ట్రాంతరపాల సమ్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ టర్మ్స్ ఆర్ వెరీ క్లియర్ టు అస్ సమ్ ఆఫ్ దెమ్ ఆర్ అంబిగ్యూస్ ఫర్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ వాట్ ఈస్ అ సేనాపతి అండ్ హూ ఈస్ అ సేన
Uh, we have given here the popular uh, view among scholars that one is the commander, another is the army paymaster. Similarly, Pradvivaka and Dharma Dhyaksha, uh, there is an overlap, uh, and so on and so forth. We better stick to the Sanskrit names because these are given in the text. So this was the structure of the administration that we just saw. If we come to local administration, the 18 Tirthas were the departmental heads. Uh, there was an intelligence department which occupied a very important place which spied upon the uh, king's own Tirthas. So such was the polity at that time. Rama asks Bharata uh, whether Bharata is spying on his own Tirthas. We see that in Ramayana except the first three and those of the surrounding kings. Evidently there was a very strong municipal administration which kept the city of Ayodhya clean, which provided street lighting in Ayodhya and which controlled the crowds in Ayodhya. Ayodhya also had an irrigation system and did not depend on rains. It is uh, very prominently mentioned this aspect in Ramayana. There were roads across the kingdom on which chariots could travel. Uh, different types of water bodies are mentioned. There must have been some local administration taking care of all this though we don't uh, get full, full details from Ramayana. Because being a Kavya, some of these mundane details are avoided there. But uh, there is nothing in Ramayana to contradict the details found in other ancient texts. From that we can figure out that uh, there was a very well defined local administration uh, of the Ghoshas which were pastoral villages, of the Gramas which were uh, agricultural villages and Patanas and Nagaras which are uh, basically towns and cities. Now let us look at the political organization society. There are two aspects to it. Uh, one is the uh, uh, division along Varna. As you are aware, there are uh, four Varnas. It is important to differentiate Varna from Jati. Varna comes from uh, Rui to choose, profession chosen. It is a professional organization. Jati is what is there by birth, what we can call as caste. So Ramana talks about four Varnas of the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras. It also talks of the four Ashramas, the Brahmacharya, Grahasthashrama, Vanaprasthashrama, and the fourth one, uh, normally today we call it sannyasa, but in Ramayana we find the terms uh, yati and parivrajaka to denote a sannyasin. And then the king's duty was to maintain varna ashrama dharma. That means each of the professions had to do their own uh, professional duty, the brahmana, kshetriya, vaishya and shudras. And each of the persons in the respective ashramas were supposed to follow duties of that ashrama. This we cite on uh, one aspect of the political or social organization is this. The other one was that there was an empire, there were states within that and within the state there were local administrative units like Grama, Ghosha, Nagara and Patana. There were also trade guilds called Shrenis in uh, cities. We look at the political organization more. Uh, Dasratha specifically states to Kaikeyi that he has control over Sindhu, Sauvira, Saurashtra, Dravida. Dakshina, Patha, Vanga, Anga, Kosala, Magatha and Matsya states. Rama declares that he is acting as a representative of Bharata in killing Rakshasas in the unsettled areas of Dandakaranya. Rama is recorded in Ramayana as having said, installed his own children and those of his brothers as kings of various kingdoms. Tribute from Samantha kings is recognized as a source of revenue. So these are all textual evidences for existence of an empire. But modern scholars opine that there was no Ikshwaku empire because imperialism of the later years such as the Mauryan empire is not seen. We can conclude that the empire was markedly different from later versions but we cannot wish away that Ramayana attests to the existence of an empire. If you look at the division of state, the kingdom was divided into uh, capital and countryside called Pura and uh, or Rajdhani or uh, the countryside was called Janapada, Rashtra, Vishaya etc. The Janapada had villages and towns. The villages were mainly Grama agricultural villages or Ghosha pastoral villages. The towns were Nagaras or Patanas. Some people believe Patanas were port towns but uh, we cannot say that conclusively. Representatives of both territories uh, called Mahattaras and various guilds are mentioned prominently. Uh, in the towns, the trading folks had their own uh, trade guilds and the representatives of these were called Naigamas. These find prominent mention, every Sabha has a few Naigamas. Now if you look at the interstate relationships, the Mandala theory was what was clearly followed in uh, Ramayana. 
Uh, we have three aspects called evaluation of textile evidence, the mandala theory and responsibility of conquering state. We'll examine each in turn. If you look at the textual evidence, we see that there were wars between states under different pretexts. Sometimes the relative of the vanquished king was installed. Often relatives of the conqueror were established as the king. In the Kachit Sarga, uh, number 100 of Ayodhya Kanda, Rama touches upon many aspects of Dandaniti, about uh, gathering intelligence, about uh, the prakritis of a kingdom, and he refers to the Mandala theory and the six strategies of interstate relationships, uh, together known as Shadgunya. These are all clearly mentioned. They are all, all the shad, elements of Shadgunya are individually mentioned in the text at different places. So this is the evidence that we have. From this evidence, we can conclude that the Mandala theory or the Mandala framework was what? The framework of interstate relationships. Uh, what does the Mandala theory say? Uh, we have expanded this in Arthasha, paper on Arthashastra, but uh, very briefly it classifies neighboring kings into 12 types and recommends an evaluation of six prakritis, that is king, minister, countryside, fort, treasury and army of each of these 12. Based on the analysis of these 72 elements, that is the six prakritis of the 12 kinds of kings, six types of actions are recommended. This is what I refer to as Shadgunya. First action is Sandhi, that is peace, or they could be war, Vigraha. Sometimes neutrality is the best course. It's called Asana, sitting on one's own seat, or Yana. This is short of war, but marching towards uh, war. Often we see in modern times that two countries don't actually fight, but they mobilize their armies. That is, they make as if they're about to start a war. This is one of the strategies. Then we have Samshraya or surrender to a more powerful king. In today's world, we call it alignment. Then there is Dvaidi Bhava. That is, on one friend there is war, on other friend there is peace, depending on the uh, relative uh, assessment of the strengths and weaknesses. Now, as the Arthashastra shows, the analysis can be very fine. It is not this simplistic. Though Ramayana does not get into such detail, it is unmistakable that the decision making with reference to interstate relations was made within the framework of this Mandala theory. Also mentioned are the four devices, Supayas called uh, uh, Samadana Bheda Dandopayas. These are very well known. Then the calamities to the various prakritis are also mentioned in the Ramayana. From all this, it is very safe to say that there's a broad agreement between Ramayana and Arthashastra with respect to interstate relationships. Now, one key feature uh, we just examine next is that uh, the conqueror has a responsibility. Today, we live in a world uh, where superpowers conquer uh, small states and then anarchy is resulting. They don't take the responsibility of governance. Such was not the case earlier. The conqueror, had a, the conqueror had a duty to provide stability in the conquered kingdom. Thus, we see that every war is followed by a stable solution. This is one effect of the supremacy of dharma. Uh, rather than self-interest of the conqueror. A conqueror could not merely plunder a kingdom and shun the responsibility of governance. This also confirms agreement between Ramayana and Arthashastra because a similar kind of responsibility is laid down in the Arthashastra. Having considered the polity in Ramayana, just let's take a step back and consider the continuity of polity in India. We see that there are similarities with descriptions in Vedas where Sabhas and Samitis are mentioned with later works such as Mahabharata and Arthashastra. Uh, we've just uh, looked at complete agreement between Arthashastra and Ramayana, and also various works on Dharmashastra. In fact, this commonality is not merely in literature. Uh, the Ashtapradhan of Shivaji were not very different from the eight uh, Amatyas of uh, Dasaratha or Rama. The idea of maintaining Varnashrama Dharma as the duty of kings is seen across Indian literature spanning two millennia. The king as the upholder of dharma and as beholden to dharma is the model which obtains throughout the historical period. Uh, thus, we can say that there has been a remarkable continuity in the polity of India, in fact, including the tax rate of Shadbhaga or one-sixth. The old Indian tax rate was always uh, 16%. In conclusion, uh, we can uh, summarize like this. Uh, the Ramayana is an important integral part of the group of texts which portray ancient Indian polity. There is a remarkable continuity in the general features of Indian polity. While other forms of governance were known, the primary one is that of uh, dharmic kingship. Here the king, kingship is, uh, kingdom is seen as a trust, that the king is holding the kingdom in trust. 
we see this very clearly in the interplay between Bharata and uh, Rama, where they treat kingdom as a duty and not as something as a uh, right. And Arajakatva was a much feared state. So throughout, uh, we see that in literature, especially in Ramayana also. As Ramayana so gloriously portrays, kingship is a trust, and the king earns his wages by serving the people. It is not a surprise then that in the 20th century, Mahatma Gandhi conveyed his vision of independent India to the public using one word. He said, let us establish Ramarajya. Thank you.